Hello everyone and thank you for attending today's um, Archive Matica Comprehensive Digital Preservation Workflows webinar. Um, so you'll notice that you are all currently muted. However, if you have questions, please do put them in chat and we will get to your questions at the end. Um, we're going to try to do the introduction and demonstration in the first 45 minutes and allow 15 minutes at the end to get to as many questions as possible. We do encourage you, however, if you don't get your question answered today, uh, to use our Archivematica public discussion list and we will be able to answer it there and that way it benefits the entire community of users. So my name is Courtney Muma. I'm an archivist and a librarian and I'm the U.S. and International Community Development Consultant for Artifactual Systems who is the head developer of Archivematica. I'm here with Sarah Romke, who's also an archivist and librarian, and she's a systems archivist who works with all of our artifactual projects. So that means Archivematica and also Adam, which is access to memory. Sarah is going to be in chat with you. So if anything is urgent, she'll answer it right away. Otherwise, again, we'll save all those questions for the end. Want to say hi, Sarah? Hi, everyone. <laughs> all right. So I'm going to go ahead and start with just a quick overview of uh, what Archivematica is. So um, we are Artifactual Systems. We're based here in Canada, and we're the lead developers of Archivematica and Access to Memory, um, which is ADAM for short. Um, we consider the package of Archivematica and Access to Memory the complete solution to digital preservation and providing access to digital materials um, that are archival and digital and heritage in nature. Um, we are archivists here, we're librarians, and we're also technologists, and we have some experience in the museum field as well, given projects that we've worked on over the past couple of years. Um, very quickly, Adam, which is again part of the uh, complete package, if you're using Archivematica, we recommend Adam, for public access and content management, um, to manage your accessions, taxonomies, multiple repositories, restrictions and rights, and your authority records in ISAR. We recommend Adam for access derivatives that can be created using Archivematica. Um, Adam also allows for streaming video, um, but even if you don't create your access copies using Archivematica, you can, you can go ahead and use Adam for other access um, to digital materials. Uh, Adam has multilingual description, uh, ISAD, RAD, DAX, EAD export, and mods. And there also is a link in your Atom description to your preserved archive packages that you create using Archivematica. Um, and there's a lot of synced metadata and uh, premise as well. But today, we're going to focus on Archivematica, which is free and open source digital preservation. Um, it operates on best practices and standards. In particular, Archivematica was designed based on the OAIS model. And so if you're familiar with OAIS, it's sort of the uh, the common language for digital preservation now. Um, Archivematica was based on OAIS, but we've expanded our functionality quite a bit since the early days. There is no barrier to Archivematica public user groups, discussions, all of our community and all of our documentation is open, um, and all of our code is available for your own review. So we're completely trans transparent in that way. Um, we offer, um, and the main benefit of using Archivematica is that you're getting consistent system independent archival information packages, or AIPs, um, which I might call APES during this discussion. So these archival information packages are stored, um, but the great thing about Archivematica AIPs is that you do not need Archivematica to read them. You can read them using any file browser. Archivematica uses the Library of Congress Bagot specification to package the AIPs. Um, we also have Dublin Core template in Archivematica that allows you to add some simple Dublin Core metadata to your package. We also have uh, METS XML that contains premise preservation metadata in our AIPs. Um, so in the course of using Archivematica and creating those AIPs, um, there are lots of things that happen um, when I'll show you in our demo. Um, that what we call these in Archivematica is microservices, and there are many more that I'm going to mention here, but just um, for brevity, these are the big ones. Um, Archivematica does integrity and virus checking, format identification, characterization and metadata extraction, some forensic activities in our digital forensic workflow, validation, 
You can do some arrangement in Archivematica, and we also offer um, transcription now. So we also allow in Archivematica normalization on ingest. So that means we migrate to preservation and or access comment um, uh, formats if you choose to do so. Sorry about that, I stuttered for a moment. Um, but we also preserve the original file. So even if you do migration to preservation format, for instance, you will also always have that original to go back to. Um, again, those AIPs are bagged using the Bagit specification and they include all of the logs and metadata from processing in Archivematica, and those are all, um, a lot of the metadata is packaged in that MEXXML, and you have logs from several of the services in your bagged AIP at the end. You can include or add metadata. Twitter, or if you subscribe to our public discussion list, you'll see that today we launched Archives Direct, which is Archivematica hosted in cloud, allowing for storage in VeraCloud. That's just one of our many storage options. We have a lot of other integrations as well. If you have any specific questions about integrations, please do ask us in chat, and we'll get to them at the end. So um, if you're Doctor Who fans, which I am, um, the ape is basically bigger on the inside. So the idea is it's a value add. It's You're not just getting storage. You're getting all of the context information, all the metadata, everything that we've done to this content during processing, and information that we'll need to understand it in the future um, when the software becomes obsolete or for whatever other reason we might need to re remigrate or change the way we're treating our access to our materials. This is a very quick look at our METS file. So in your AIP, you have a METS.XML, and at a very high level, it contains your descriptive metadata section. So that's your DMD sec there in the beginning, um, and that is Dublin Core XML. Um, some of our workflows allow for multiple descriptive met metadata sections. For instance, if you're doing digital forensics ingest, you'll have a secondary descriptive metadata section, and you can include some uh, descriptive metadata about the process of creating your forensic image. We have an administrative metadata section that includes most of your premise output, so that includes the technical metadata about the object, so the preservation object itself, and that's both your original and your normalized object for preservation. We have information about the events and agents, and those are again premise elements. The events um, are our microservices in Archivematica, and not all of our microservices are premise events, but right now we have 18 that are, and if you're curious about that, we describe them in detail on our wiki. Um, we have premise agents that include not only the person who is the signed in user, but also the system itself, so what version of Archivematica you're using, and then any of the tools in Archivematica that are actually running along with their version. And then also premise rights and restrictions, so anything that you add in the uh, premise rights and restrictions template in Archivematica will be recorded here and then packaged in the MET. Then we have our files section, which is a list of the files with their roles and relationships to each other in the METS file. And finally, we have our struct map, which is a representation of the actual physical structure of the entire AIP. Um, these are some of our partners, and this is actually a little bit of an old slide, so we have several more that have added since this. Um, so if you have any questions in particular about types of organizations that we're working with, um, please do, again, ask in chat. Um, so what we do is basically partner with organizations, and they help us make Archivematica better, um, add new features over time, change features if necessary, and anything we do, we try to make sure that it's something that's going to be useful for the community at large and not too specific for any particular organization. Here's a list of some of our integrations so far. I won't go into all of them, but you can ask um, at the end if you want to talk about any of these in particular. Um, but we, what we try to do is build a system that allows for integration at multiple endpoints. So a good example is that we can take in content from DSpace, for example, at the very beginning of processing in Archivematica um, and choose to output to Atom, or we can choose to output storage to Locks as our storage. Um, so a lot of different options in a lot of different places where you can do integration with other systems. Um, I'll come back to this slide when we're having a Q&A, but just quickly, this is our Archivematica and Access to Memory. Um, these are both of the websites, and they have lots of documentation information and links to the development wikis, so you can look into things we're working on there. 
Um, and then our discussion list is linked here as well. And again, if, if your question doesn't get answered today, please do ask it on the list and then we'll share the answer publicly. Um, now I'm going to go ahead and switch over to sharing my screen with you. And great. So now we are actually looking at the Archivematica dashboard. So this is the Archivematica dashboard. Right now I'm running it in Chrome. And you can also run it um, in Firefox. We find that it runs very well in Chrome and Firefox, and those are the two browsers that we recommend highest. When I talk about the Archivematica dashboard, I'm going to refer to tabs. When I say tabs, I'm talking about across the top here. So you'll see transfer, ingest, archival storage, preservation planning, access, and administration. And then here you'll see that I am a signed in user. In this case, my name is Unicorn. And you'll see a little green light here that says that I am connected. So we will start our processing here in transfer, but before we begin, I'm going to show you something in the administration tab. So here's our administration tab. There are a lot of settings that you can adjust here, um, including settings for some of our integrations. But the thing I want to point out is this processing configuration, which is your first option here in administration. Processing configuration allows you to define where Archivematica stops and allows you as the user to make a decision about processing workflow. So in this case, um, there, I've left many of the decisions in the dashboard um, for so that I can show you during the de demonstration where those will fall, but some things I've changed so that they default make a decision. When you're testing with Archivematica and learning about Archivematica, I recommend unclicking all of these so that you can see where all the decision points fall. And then eventually, once you know your workflows and if they're consistent, then you can pre-make these decisions and your workflow doesn't have to stop and ask you questions as frequently as it will in today's demonstration. So I'm going to jump back over to transfer. And what I'm going to do is start a new transfer in Archivematica, but I'm also going to use some of the previous transfers that you see here in the dashboard um, to illustrate some of the microservices while I do that. So um, the use case scenario is that you are an archivist or a librarian, um, and what you need to do is process some digital materials that you've got somewhere on a local server, um, anywhere that you have access to. And then what you would do is pre-configure the Archivematica storage service, which I won't go into in detail today, but which is necessary in order to configure the transfer source location, so where your digital objects live before you run them through Archivematica, and then anywhere you're going to store your AIPs and possibly store your um, access copies or your DIPs, dissemination information packages. So we're going to presume that you've already set up all of that using the Archivematica storage service. And what you would see is if you had multiple directories that contained content, in this dropdown you would see all of those directories. In this case, we just have one directory that we have configured as a transfer source location. And then we're going to browse in that directory all the way down to the content that we want to run through Archivematica. So you'll see that we only see directories here. We're not going to see digital objects, and that's because Archivematica assumes that you are going to be processing directories, not individual objects. So your directories, however, can have hierarchies in them. So you can have um, multiple levels of directories within your structure, and you would just choose the top level or whatever level that you wanted to define as the transfer itself. In this case, I'm going to choose the top level. And the way I do that is just by clicking Add. And then what happens is you see it show here. I need to assign a name to this transfer, and that can be anything that you need it to be in your workflow. I'm going to call this webinar 2 because it's the second one I've done today. And if you have an accession number, you can assign that as well here. You do not have to. This is not a required field, but you must assign a transfer name. So you can also add to this, if you browse again in the same or another directory from the dropdown, you can continue adding transfers, in which case they would be webinar 2.1, webinar 2.2, etc. In this case, I'm just going to do one for brevity. I'm going to click the big green start transfer, and now all of the content is being copied over to the Archivematica processing server. 
when Archive Matica is asking you to make a decision, you see a little bell icon here at the level of the transfer microservices. So my decision to make now is just whether, yes, this is a transfer that I want to accept and approve in Archive Matica. And so I will do that. Um, while I'm approving that, I'm going to show you that you can expand any of these other transfers that have started before. So I'll expand um, artifactual systems here. And you'll see that when I expand that, there are many microservices. And if you expand any of these individual microservices, you see the detailed jobs that occur within those microservices. Additionally, if you have any errors, what would happen is the microservice line would turn red. And then when you expanded it, the error, the job where the error occurred would also be read. And then you could actually click on this task cog. And it opens a detailed report in another tab that shows not only what arguments were run, but what contents they were run on. And if there had been an error, you would see the error in a red box here. And then they would all be sifted towards the top. In this case, I don't have any errors in my dashboard. So you'll see that the one we just started, Webinar 2, after I approved it, it went through several microservices. Again, these microservices are just functional. They're a group of jobs to accomplish one piece of um, the Archivematica workflow. Some of them are microservices that just allow the Archivematica processor to handle the materials appropriately, and others are to control things like the integrity of the materials over time, um, and also to capture metadata that we need to have in our METS XML for the transfer. So I'm not going to go through all of them in detail, but I'm going to go through some highlights of the microservices. And again, you can read about all of these in our public documentation or ask questions about any of them that you have as we're going. So um, you'll see here that the transfer itself was renamed and assigned a universal identifier. So that is what this UUID, it's a unique universal identifier. And so that's been given to the transfer package itself. So that's all of the contents that was in that directory we selected. But then assign, um, it's also assigned file UUIDs. So all of the individual digital objects also have their own universal identifiers. Checksums have also been assigned. And if you had included checksums from some other system, then Archivematica could also verify those. It's generated the transfer METS XML document. So I want to point out that this METS XML here is not the same as the METS XML that will end up in your AIP as the AIP METS XML but it will be in your AIP um, associated with the original transfer. So any information that you have here, for instance, in the struct map that contains information about the um, original order of your contents will be in this METS XML. You'll see that there's a microservice for quarantining, which we have skipped. Um, that's default in Archivematica to skip, skip quarantine, but you can change that configuration in Archivematica if you choose to do so. We've scanned for viruses, and this is one of the errors in Archivematica where if you see red here, then Archivematica kicks everything out. So if there's any error, if there's any virus detected, um, everything stops in Archivematica and the content is kicked off the server. Um, so not all errors in Archivematica do that, however. For instance, if you have an error with format identification, you're able to review that as an archivist and then you're empowered to make a decision about whether you want to keep running that through Archivematica or not. So you'll see that we're at the next decision point, Gener generate transfer structure report. Um, this is a new development in Archivematica that was funded by Harvard, by Harvard Business School Library. And <clears throat> so I explained before that the METS XML has some original order information embedded within it. However, we wanted to have some text files generated that also recorded information about that original order. And so that's what this transfer structure report is. It's running a tool called tree in the background, and you get a text file that shows the structure of your transfer. So all the directories in it, the objects within those directories, and where those directories live in the structure of the content. So I'm going to go ahead and say yes. I'll generate that for this set of materials. And then that's going to be a log in the transfer, and it will stay with your content all the way through to the archival information package to storage. So now we're at the microservice to identify our file format. And I think I've accidentally clicked on something <laughs> that I did not mean to click on. So my apologies. I just messed it up by accident. So I'll go into this other one. And in 
identify file format, you choose your format identification tool. Um, in Archivematica, you can choose between FIDO and, format and file extension. I chose FIDO in this case. FIDO is a tool by the Open Preservation Foundation. Um, and, what, and what FIDO does is it uses pronom identifiers, so PUIDs, um, from the pronom for format registry in the UK um, to identify file formats. Archivematica's format policy registry, which I'll show you in a moment, is actually synced with Pronom. And then once those are identified, Archivematica, if there are any packages in your content, Archivematica will ask you if you would like to extract content um, from them. So this means if you have something like a zip file or a tarball or a digital forensic image, then you can extract the content from that and run it in Archivematica. Additionally, Archivematica will ask, would you like to keep the original? So that means you don't have to keep that original zip, for instance. You could only keep the content that you extracted from it and then continue on processing with that. The Characterize and Extract Metadata Microservice runs by default a tool called FITS, which is File Information Toolset created by Harvard. And File Information Toolset has a lot of tools in it that do um, a really good job of doing characterization and extraction of metadata. And basically, it compares the output of those tools and picks the best. Um, and then you get that recorded in your METs. We've also done some work, thanks to the Museum of Modern Art um, and to Yale, to add tools that do very good characterization and extraction of metadata for digital forensic images and audiovisual content. If you're curious about those new tools in particular, um, we can answer questions about those at the end, but something else you might want to do is check out our preservation planning tab. And in our preservation planning tab, we have something called the Format Policy Registry. And the Format Policy Registry contains all of the rules um, for many of these microservices in Archivematica. So you'll see here, if you go down to characterization and you go to commands, you'll be able to see there's fits that I talked about that's our regular default, but also other tools exist here. So um, if you want detail about this, again, we have good documentation on our wiki. But this is the time I wanted to show you that in the preservation planning tab, this format policy registry is something that allows you to have some control over many of the microservices that Archivematica runs. Um, so we have formats here that are synced with Pronom. You can update from the Format Policy Registry server that Artifactual Systems manages so that if we add any new rules over time for any particular formats and their transformations, then you can grab them by just updating from your local dashboard. So you'll see here a lot of things that we just saw in the microservices, identification, characterization, extraction. So in each of these sections, if you um, look at our public demo and take a gander at some of these, you'll be able to drill down and look at the rules and commands and the tools that are run depending on what format has been identified to carry out the actions that actually occur in the dashboard. We'll have a future webinar that focuses on the FPR entirely. It's quite a big thing to tackle. So I just wanted to show you that really quickly at this stage. So let's jump back over to transfer. Our characterization and extraction has been completed. And then after that, we run validation. This runs Jove. Examine contents gives you a choice about whether you would like to run a tool called Bulk Extractor. It's a digital forensic tool, but it doesn't run on just digital forensic images. It also runs on directories. So what Bulk Extractor does is it creates these things called features, and they're just textual reports. They're text files that identify whether there is any email address, or any email addresses in the content, whether there are any credit card numbers, um, social security numbers or social insurance numbers, et cetera. And then basically you have those for your own consultation in your AIP. And then you can choose at Create SIP from Transfer, you can make a choice about sending your transfer to a backlog or processing it immediately in, in ingest. So let me explain. You would send it to a backlog if you wanted to do any kind of arrangement or if for whatever reason you just didn't have the resources to continue processing right away in Archivematica. So I've actually prepared, I've sent several things to the blog, and I've also sent several into the ingest workflow. 
So the first thing I'll do is show you the ingest, um, the transfer backlog. So here at the top of the ingest tab, we see a search. Anything that we've sent to a transfer backlog has been indexed using Elasticsearch. And you see you can add multiple facets to your search. You've got and or not searching. Um, here in this drop down, you have some specific searches you can do. And I just want to point out accession number. So if you had several transfers and had assigned an accession number at the beginning of that transfer, then you could look up using this accession number all of the transfers associated with that accession and then do your arrangement here in this uh, originals and arrangement panel. In this case, I know exactly what I have in my um, backlog. So I'm just going to do a generic search. And what's going to happen is everything in my backlog is going to show up, all the results of this search are going to show up in this originals panel here. So this is the originals panel. Again, this is just the results of the search that I've performed. In this case, it's everything in my backlog. Um, in this panel, you can, you're going to see a lot of things. So first, we have all the transfers that I've sent to backlog. So that's what you see this top level. Notice that um, the name I give it is this first part. And then the universal identifier that's been assigned to the transfer package is appended to the file to the name of the transfer. If you expand any of these, you'll see three folders in each case. Um, you'll notice that in all of them, logs and metadata are always grayed out. And that's because you cannot make any changes to logs that have been generated or to any of the metadata so far in Archivematica. Um, that's because you don't want to lose any of that information about the process so far. But you'll notice that, for instance, down here, objects is not grayed out. And that's because there's still content in this transfer that needs to be put into a SIP. This one is grayed out because everything in this case has been put into a SIP and processed in Archivematica. So even though you can't do anything to your logs, or your metadata, you can view them here. So if you expand and you click on, for instance, our file format identification log, get this red box around it and click on view file, then another tab will open up and this is actually the results of the FIDO tool. So this is how FIDO identified each of these formats and you can go through and analyze this now. So again, you can't change it, but you can view it and you can do the same with the contents of the metadata folder. Now, this is called the SIP arrangement pane over here. So this means that we're going to make our submission information package. We're going to put it together in a way that's going to mirror how we want the AIP to be to be created, <clears throat> compiled, sorry. So um, in the arrangement panel here, I add a directory. I name it. Oh, oops, sorry, I clicked off of that for a second. You can name it anything you want. And I'll just say that this is a series. And then once I've added that and I expand a range, there is my new folder. So I can continue creating, um, adding directories, and I can embed them even further. So multiple levels of hierarchy are possible here. So I could have a series and I could put multiple files in it, for instance. Um, some of these other ones you see here are work that I've done before, but that I haven't processed yet. So even if you sign out of Archivematica, you'll lose the results of your search, but any arrangement you've already done stays there until you're ready to go ahead and process it. So you don't have to do all of your processing in one sitting. So once I have um, all of the directories that I want, then I start moving objects over into the new SIP. So you can either drag the entire folder from a transfer or individual objects. So for instance, I can take just this one and drop it in. Or if I know I want the whole folder from this or any of these other transfers, then I would drag it and drop it over. In this case, drag, drop, there you go. So even if you take one thing from a transfer, whether you take an entire directory or just one object from a transfer and combine them into a new SIP, 
you still get all of the logs or metadata in your new SIP. So for every transfer from which you derive any part of that SIP, you get all of the logs and metadata and they are unchanged. Additionally, there's an arrangement log that is created that records everything that you're doing during this process and that ends up in your um, AIP at the end of the process as well. Once you're done here, you select at the highest level that you want to define as your SIP. And again, this will mirror your AIP structure. So it's circled um, when you select it, it gets that red box around it, and then you would select Create SIP. And then accept that it's created. And what's happened, it's gonna show up here in our ingest tab. And then we approve it, and it'll continue going through the same process as if we had just sent it directly from transfer into ingest and skipped the entire transfer backlog process. All right, so um, I'm going to go through a few of these just to illustrate a few things. So um, we have some uh, microservices that run just to prepare the content for normalization. So many of these microservices I won't go into in detail. Um, it's doing some cleanup, for instance, about of the file names. And again, that doesn't impact the metadata in the Mets. You always have your original file name, so don't let that concern you. So before I normalize, I want to show you our data template that allows you to add that simple Dublin Core metadata, but also allows you to add premise rights and restrictions. So if I click on that template, down here at the bottom, you see metadata. If I click Add, you'll see here there are some simple Dublin Core elements. Anything that you add here will apply at the level of the SIP, so it's the whole package, um, and so not the individual objects within it. And one good reminder about that is here under metadata, you're actually going to see the name of the SIP that you're working on right now. Um, something here called, called part of AIC has to do with our um, data set workflow. And we were, we're going to have a future webinar about AICs because um, it's a very big topic. But if you're curious, it's documented quite well on our website. Another thing you can do with metadata is add premise rights and restrictions. So under rights here, click add, you'll see under basis, um, multiple bases, so copyright, statute, license, donor, policy, and other. You can have multiple bases for rights and restrictions per SIP. And again, it applies to the package. And then for each basis that you assign, you also have multiple acts. And these acts can be anything from dissemination to migration, exhibit, etc. Um, and then you get the grant and restriction you can set per act for allow, disallow, or something called conditional, which is something like um, it might be conditional if you need a form filled out and then you would put information about that form in the restriction note. So assuming I've done everything I want to do in rights and restrictions and Dublin Core metadata, then I can hop back into my ingest tab and I can begin doing my normalization, which is the main function of the ingest tab in Archivematica. So um, in the normalization drop-down menu, I have a lot of choices. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I want to point out the first here is normalize for preservation and access. So this allows you to make your archival information package as well as a dissemination information package, so an ape and a dip. So your AIP will then have your preservation copy as well as your original and the METs and logs. And then your access copy will have any access copies that you generate and the identical METs as your AIP. You can also choose to skip making access copies entirely and just normalize for preservation. And then you'll see there are lots of other options here too, but the last I want to point out now is normalize manually, which allows you to use a tool locally that is not provided for in Archivematica, in particular if you have a proprietary local tool that you have access to, um, and you prefer the way that it does a migration of a format to one of the open source tools in Archivematica, you can choose to use that here. I'm going to choose to normalize for preservation and access. So I'm going to make an AIP and a DIP. And what's happening once I've made this decision is Archivematica is calling up rules that we've set in our preservation planning tab in our format policy registry. And again, we'll have a follow-up webinar later this year on the FPR because it's quite a detailed system 
Um, but the, the thing to know in this discussion is that several of our microservices call out the FPR to find out that for a particular format, um, this is the command to run, this is the tool to use on that particular format, and this is the output that Archivematica expects. And so that's what's happening here is it's getting the rules for normalization to access and preservation copies. So now that the normalization has completed, we have two ways to review the results. We can look at the normalization report here. So this report lists the file name, the format that it's been identified as by FIDO in this case, and then um, whether preservation normalization and access normalization was tempted and then how it did, whether it failed or not. If anything fails, it's gonna be red. So if anything shows up red, then you're gonna wanna click on and figure out exactly what happened during that process. And it'll give you an error report that looks very much like the task cog report that we looked at in the microservice job in transfer. So another way to review the results of your normalization are by clicking review and in another tab, you can expand down and we ran preservation and access normalization. So we're gonna expand this preservation and access folder. There we see um, that's our SIP. It's had, now it has a UUID added to it. That's the UUID for the archival information package. If you expand this, then you'll see in your DIP, you'll see your access copies. So you'll see these are all your access copies here. If you have a viewer um, for any of these formats in your web browser, then you can even view this content. So for instance, if I click on this JPEG, there's my JPEG in my browser. So those are the access copies. If you go down a bit, if you close that and go down a little further to objects here, this contains your originals and then also the preservation copies. And you can view these in the same way that you can view the contents of the dip. So if everything looks good to you here, then you go back to your ingest tab and you say, yes, we're happy and we approve the results of that normalization. All right, so I'm going to show you a couple of other um, microservices here that we skipped, um, that we pre-configured to skip. One is transcribe SIP contents. This is um, OCR transcription, but we have we hope to add more transcription for things like audiovisual materials in the future. Um, process submission documentation. Um, this is a microservice that allows you to process anything like donor agreements or accession forms that you might include with your content but isn't content proper, so it's not the preservation objects, but it's related to and about the digital preservation objects, you can process it in the same way you process the other materials in order to prepare this for storage. Um, and now what's happening is Archivematica has prepared our dissemination information package as well as our AIP. So now all we have to do is store or upload to systems. So first, I'm gonna store our AIP. In this case, I only have one location that I've pre-configured using the Archivematica storage service. So that's where I'll be storing the AIP. But if you have multiple locations, then you'll see multiple locations in the dropdown here and be able to select from one of them. For my access copies, I can either upload them to an access system like Archivist Toolkit Content DM or the one that Artifactual develops, Atom, which is access to memory or you can choose to actually store the dip in a location that you've pre-configured. So in this case, I'm gonna go ahead and store the dip and it's gonna ask me where I wanna store that. And it's the same as with the AIP. If I have multiple locations configured, it'll give me multiple locations as options. But in this case, I only have one. So I'm just gonna select that one for storage. So now it's just finishing everything up. Um, I wanted to quickly show you, if I had uploaded to Atom for access, this is what it would look like. So your, your item would show up in Atom, and it would be in this hierarchy of a description that you've already created previously. So you'll see we've got a series here with multiple items in it that have clearly been uploaded from Archivematica directly. And the digital object metadata that you see here comes directly from Archivematica as well. This is the archival information package that it's associated with in Archivematica. So if you wanted to go back to Archivematica and search for this particular AIP universal identifier, 
then that's how you would download your originals and your preservation copies. So we're going to hop back over to Archivatica to see if it's completed everything. It has stored the AIP and it has stored the DIP. And so we can actually go to this archival storage tab here. <clears throat> and this is our archival storage search. It allows you to search AIPs that have been stored and indexed using Elasticsearch. It looks a lot like the transfer backlog search. So you'll see here you can search on specific parts of the METs. Um, you can also just do any, however, and search much of our METs XML has been indexed. You can also add multiple facets to this search, and you have and or not searching exactly like you have in the transfer backlog search. You can choose as well to, search to show files. So instead of seeing a list of AIPs as the results of your search, you can choose to show files. And I'll just do a generic search to show you what that looks like. And then you'll see some of these even have thumbnails generated. There are rules in Archivematica's FPR and the Preservation Planning tab for generating those thumbnails. Um, so wherever those rules exist, then you'll see a thumbnail here. You can download from here any of these files from your AIP. And you can also download the entire AIP if you do an AIP search from this tab. So now that we've reached the end of the process, I see that I have hit my mark and we have just enough time to hopefully get to all of your questions. As I am losing my voice, <laughs> and Sarah has been monitoring the questions as they've been coming in, I'm going to go ahead and hand over to her. Um, I want to let you all know that I realize I talk rather quickly, and that's because there are a lot of things to cover in Archivematica. And unfortunately, even going through this today in 45 minutes, I've only showed you the most basic work show, workflow in Archivematica. Um, there's a lot more you can do with it, and there are a lot more workflows that you can configure based on the kind of content that you're dealing with. So any questions you have about specific content will be really good for this discussion today. Um, and just any questions that you have from what I talked about, um, any integrations we've done, et cetera, and Sarah will answer those for you. Um, while she's talking, I'm going to have on the back of the screen here a link again. So um, here are the two websites, the archivematica.org and access to memory.org websites. But um, any questions that we can't get to today, uh, right now we've got 15 minutes left about. So if we can't get to your questions, then you can go to the public user forum and ask anything. It can be technical, it can be workflow based, it can be an opinion about the way we do stuff argue with us. We love that. So um, please do feel free. Um, it's an open discussion and we have a really eager community to share um, answers and things they've figured out and things they would like to see in Archivematica. So with that, I will stop talking and hand over for questions to Sarah Romke. Hi, everyone. So if you, uh, if you have outstanding questions, feel free to type them into chat. While you're uh, preparing your question, I'll answer a couple that came in during the webinar. Um, this question may have already been answered uh, just through the demonstration, but one person asked um, if Atom or ICA Atom, which was the previous version of Access to Memory, um, would be uh, helpful in preserving digital objects. And as you saw in the demonstration, Archivematica fulfills the digital preservation workflows while uh, Atom lets you provide access to those digital objects that you've preserved while maintaining a link between your access copy and your archival storage system. So we see them as uh, two tools that fulfill two different purposes, but work really well together. Um, obviously, since we've developed them both, we have the opportunity to, uh, to make them as seamless as we possibly can. Um, but as Courtney showed, there are other access uh, solutions that you could possibly work with with Archivematica workflows as well. So uh, Atom is definitely a piece of the puzzle, particularly if you're uh, trying to see your, di your uh, digital preservation workflow all the way through to access, but the preservation piece is really taken care of in Archivematica. Another question that came up was, uh, where would you look to find information on setting up different uh, pipelines and different uh, storage uh, situations? And that would be through the um, all of the storage and transfer source uh, locations are set up through a separate application which we call the storage service 
And if you go to the archivematica.org website and click on documentation, you'll see links not just to Archivematica documentation, but also to storage service documentation. And that is where you would find that information. If you have any questions at all about setting up um, the storage service and setting up different transfer locations or ape storage locations, we would welcome your questions on the user forum, of course. That's a great place to go for help. Uh, so I just see that there's another question come in through chat, so I'm just going to scroll up a bit. Um, the question is, how are iterative processes handled, um, such as uh, running ingest, changing thumbnail size? Oh, I see. So if uh, I guess the question is sort of like, is the is processing through Archivematica iterative in the sense that if you start something and you're not liking the results, can you kind of go back and try again? Um, there are several places in the Archivematica workflow where you can cancel your processing and start again. Um, the ability to change the workflow partway through and to go back and redo a step. Um, the only place where you can really do that is that normalization. Um, when Courtney showed you that you can um, check the normalization report, um, and then decide if you want to approve or reject the normalization. You can also redo it at that point. So you can redo normalization and say, I want to try a different normalization path, for example. You could also, in the meantime, um, before redoing your normalization, go and change your format policy registry rules to say, oh, I, I didn't like the output of that particular uh, migration. I'd like it to do something differently. Um, that should work too. Uh, other than that, I can't think of any other places in the Archivematica workflow where you can sort of redo a process. Um, that would be an area uh, that might be interesting for development in the future. Uh, but for the time being, uh, normalization would be the point at which you can sort of uh, change your mind and, and remake your decision. Are there any other questions that you'd like to put into chat? We'll give you all a couple of minutes to do that if you'd like to. While you're um, thinking about questions, I could uh, maybe give a plug for our next webinar, uh, which will be for Adam. Um, so we're planning that for early March. And if you check our Google group, uh, both the Archivematica and the Adam Google groups and our Twitter feeds, uh, we will have registration information uh, for that webinar as well. So. If that's something that interests you, if, if uh, this webinar actually has piqued your interest about Adam as well, uh, we do encourage you to, to sign up for an Adam focused webinar as well. So we'll give it just another uh, minute or so for questions in case anybody has something uh, that they just haven't had a chance to type out yet. Well, we don't see any um, any indication that anybody is typing a question. So I think that that probably concludes our webinar today. Um, I personally would like to thank Courtney for all that talking that she just did. And uh, of course, we'd like to thank all of you for signing in and uh, for being part of the Archivematica community. Uh, we really appreciate your participation and we would love to see you on the forums or um, checking us out on Twitter, uh, whatever way you'd like to get in touch. Thank you, everyone. Take care.